ultimately it's we're all going to have to buy less stuff we're going to have to share more we're going to have to grow more food and that all involves other human beings um so uh, and and it's joyful and it makes us feel better and then when we feel better we buy less shit that we don't need because we're not trying to fill this empty hole with you know we're feeling nurtured and we're feeling loved and connected you're listening to the spaceship earth podcast with me dan burgess uh Thanks for tuning in. Welcome to the show. This is episode 26. It's been a little while coming, this one. This is a pretty special episode. Well, they're all pretty special, to be honest. But this is uh, this is a conversation with a uh, remarkable woman called Natalie Fee. And uh, Nat is the co-founder of an organisation called City to Sea and of uh, another organisation which is a part of that, which is called Refill. So what is this podcast all about? Well, we're living on a life-giving rock called Earth, hurtling through space. How bonkers is that? But like a spaceship, we have a finite amount of supplies and an intelligent operating system which keeps everything replenished as long as we all respect it and use it wisely. So an understanding of how this system works along with deep cooperation between humans and all life is essential to keep us and the spaceship flying. Someone awesome once said, There are no passengers on Spaceship Earth. We are all crew. So in this podcast, I'm riffing with humans involved in restoring and regenerating, raising awareness and shifting consciousness, reimagining how we might live more beautifully through creativity, care, ideas, collaborations, community, new forms of business and much more. I talk to artists, photographers, entrepreneurs, activists, writers, designers, strategists, adventurers, healers, creative mavericks and many more. I believe their stories can inspire all of us to become more planetary, to fully participate as crew on the Spaceship Earth. Um, If you are somebody that's been trying to get themselves off plastic water bottles and has noticed water fountains springing up all over the place and the ability to um, refill bottles of water in various establishments on the high street, that's basically Nat's work um, through refill. Um, and uh, amazing campaigning work with City to Sea, which has been kind of creatively bringing to life um, our kind of uh, plastic pollution habits, um, particularly and how they a lot of them uh, start their journey into the ocean through our um, through our toilets and our loos. Um, City to Sea, great campaigning org. You, um, I'll link to all of the stuff they're doing. But anyway, Nat is um, has been driving these things um, based out in Bristol. And they've been spreading um, uh, really fast uh, in the last couple of years um, across the UK and beyond. Um, and Nat is also, as well as a campaigner activist, she's a she's a writer and speaker. And in fact, has just authored a new book, which is available now from all good bookshops and bookstores. Um, and uh, you should grab yourself a copy. And it's called uh, How to Save the World for Free. I see Nat as a bit of an artist as well, actually. Um, uh, very creative, very interesting, and has been journeying... Um, in, in, in its truest sense, really. And, and I think um, what this conversation hopefully does is give you a sense of that journey that's been on. I'm always intrigued and interested in the journeys that people take um, that lead them into a, um, a life uh, which is sort of deeply considered, often involving some form of healing of... Uh, the world around us um, because that is the thread really on this show Um, folks that are kind of kind of involved in the healing process of our planet um, trying to regenerate life Um, so this is episode 26 I'm going to cut straight to it Um, I hope you enjoy this one this is episode 26 of the Spaceship Earth podcast with Natalie Fee from City to Sea so Nat welcome to the Spaceship Earth podcast Thank you very much. <laughs> very happy to be here. Yeah, it's um, <coughs> yeah. Actually, the, uh, you're the uh, you're the only the second real life person to be real life podcasted <gasps> in down in here in Tut Bottom of Garden. Oh, it's a, it's an honour. This is your your modern day man shed, and I get to come <laughs> in it. <laughs> this is this is mission control of the spaceship <laughs> Earth, and uh, it's nice because I sometimes I do them. Well, I do quite a lot of them, like you know you know via the old interweb mm. which is good and handy 
but there's nothing like having a kind of a real life conversation. I know we've got a real life fire going in the yeah. corner and real life cups of tea. I know, <laughs> and it's real life pissing it down outside. Yeah, it's actually and making uh, it feel quite cozy in here. It's a bit nautical sometimes in here. Sort of, you can sort of. Well, anyway. We'll get into that. Yeah. We'll get into the nautical stuff. Nautical spaceships. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Cabins. Nautical spaceships, cabins. Everyone whatever you have, want it to be. Everyone should have <laughs> one. Looks bread on the go. I know. I'm so impressed with that. <laughs> so, well, what I'd like to do before we sort of get into kind of like, um, where are we? We're in, well, the end of November 2019. Mm. Um, There's quite a lot been going on right now in this year. Um and but what I love what I love to do uh, with these podcasts is um, is give some context to our listeners um, around you know we're going to get into all your work and all your missions with which there are several um, but it'd be really nice just to give people a bit <laughs> of con- several. Yes, it's yeah, several there's missions. a few <laughs> <Several> yeah <missions. laughs> but just like, in. just like you know just like your a bit of your story really before we sort of unpack all the stuff that's going on. Sure. Um, it'd just be really interesting because I think, you know, yeah, like how you've got to where you are is often quite, it's often quite an interesting place to start. Mm. So could you like give us a little bit of that? Yeah, where do you want to start? A little bit of that story mm. or... Yeah, I mean, it's been a real, I, like, I describe it as a coyote trail, but apparently not many people know what I mean by that, but like a real winding path that that Mm. made no sense at the time but actually when I look back on all the things that I did along the way they've all kind of fed into what I'm doing now. Mm. When did you start journeying then? When did it all, when did the coyote start? start? Well I think it started (laughs) when it got it like it the coyote went to university when I was when I was 18 and I wasn't really ready to go but I was kind of pushed into it. Mm. Um, I think my parents thought it would get me back on the straight and narrow <laughs> but I dropped out after about six weeks and ended up what, get, did, you st- what did you study I was doing um, <laughs> communication studies in French oh. French has been a big part of my life anyway but I um how come I think my mum my mum got really into speaking French later in life and she took it upon herself to teach it to me mm. which I'm actually really grateful for because I did end up living and working in France for a little while um and and I love it. I love just being able to. It's like it doubles your your kind of opportunities in terms of if you can speak another language, you can go and that you've got a whole other country that you can go and exist in. May we, may we. Yeah, a whole other lot of boyfriends <laughs> you can have, huh? <laughs> um, so yeah, but so I, the French things happen. So you went to, you went to college to to study French to do that a bit more. Yeah, um, but it just didn't six feel six weeks. Six weeks. Isn't six that weeks. Long. No, <laughs> <laughs> I went to the University of North London. Funnily enough, Sinead O'Connor was studying there at the same time, doing something really right on and positive. Um, Bumped into her in the corridors one day. And uh, yeah, I dropped out and became an IT recruitment consultant quite quickly after leaving university. And that was at the end of the 90s when like the internet were just invented. I remember that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Oh, was I was actually I was actually uh, uh, in a internet radio startup at the end of the nineties, and wow. when the internet just it, you know when it just collapsed, you know when it sort of boomed and then it, w- it sort of went bust. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's when I was starting the thing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Good timing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, time, terrible timing. Yeah, well, I was one of those like I would say awful. I wasn't really awful, but it was just an it, an amazing place for a young you know girl, young woman to be, and it was you know good fun but it was it was corporate and I learned business I learned sales and um and I also learned what it was like to be incredibly materially successful and realize that that isn't what was you know that didn't make me happy so I was like 21 earning 60 grand a year mm. which you know, a lot of money. 20 years ago was quite a lot of money mm. and um what so did you when you because the six weeks at uni then so then how did you just what told you that you just needed to move on and get into work? What was, I mean, how do you make that kind of decision? I just like wasn't, it just wasn't vibing for me. I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't connecting with the, with the university. I wasn't connecting with the people there. I wasn't connecting with the, the land, you know, I mean, land in North London, Holloway Road. But for some people that might be absolutely the right place to be, but it really didn't feel like that for me. And I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life. So it just didn't really make sense. Mm. 
Mm. So I just, and I think I was quite, um, quite good really at just sensing what what I needed to do and felt like I had the freedom to do that. Mm. I trusted actually I was going to be okay. My parents were like, if you drop out, we're never going to support you financially again. So, and then like three years later, I was earning more than both of them combined. Yeah. And so how long did the, so so you got into work, IT recruitment, so quite buzzy kind of at that time, I guess, as well, because it was like a totally new, the whole digital thing was just sort of emerging, wasn't it, really? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, Was it was a, a, a really interesting, you know, crazy time, you know, and also hedonistic, and mm. and all my friends were kind of going off traveling to India at that point, whereas I'd kind of ended up getting into this, corporate world a business world so I'd be doing this like executive by day and then I'd be coming home generally rolling a joint mm. studying Hinduism and Buddhism and learning to play the guitar <laughs> so I had this like hippie by night you were still at university really at night then were you? <laughs> yeah. like, Maybe quite it, was. Left. it was my own university <laughs> yeah. yeah the University of Nat <laughs> brilliant uh, yeah. Wow, so these sort of two, these kind of slightly parallel, different kind of universes that you were traversing yeah. day and night. Yeah, and then I think it was it was about 22 when I realised that, like, as I said, that all the material stuff, I had a house, I had a car, you know, that wasn't doing it for me. And again, I was like, this isn't, this isn't it. And so I sold it all and left my, my boyfriend and I went off to um, South America and I actually did feel this call right then to actually really feel like to get my hands into the earth and mm. uh, I'd been becoming aware of environmental issues, but also my spiritual sort of self was awakening and I wanted to go off and, and explore that. So I went off on my own and, and spent a year in South America. Where did you go? Mostly in Ecuador. I was there for about nine months and then I was in uh, Peru for about three months and Bolivia for a month and just learning folk songs and learning to speak well I, I spoke Spanish as well at that point um learning hanging out with indigenous communities and in the jungle a little bit as well and actually I set up like we got involved in a project and we set up our first sort of you know project to raise money for indigenous communities out there wow and so what so that must have been I mean a complete eye-opener in terms of like I think, you know, when you when you travel to quite, you know, rad, quite radically different cultures, particularly at that age, you're still quite young, right? 20s? Yeah, 20 I was 23. Um, and I, you know, that was where I came, you know, face to face with deforestation and mining, like, you know, extraction and, and people in, in communities being poisoned by, by mines and seeing like Nestle importing... Um, what was it like the milk powder and sugar into communities mm. so women were not breastfeeding their kids i was like witnessing all that firsthand and um so that was it was really eye opening and also it was eye opening to hang out with people you know who had actually a very similar upbringing to me like the city kids we'd watch the same things on telly and were into the same kind of thing so it was i saw both sides really mm. and and so 9 months to a year and then what how did what where 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 were you at then? What was so the creative got restless <laughs> again? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking for another pathway. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So at that point, the Koyoti got got very spiritual, right? Um, and I kind of you know was thinking about going down the shamanistic path, given that I was in South America. Um, but I ended up going back to my roots back in Southampton, and I found a, a yoga teacher there, and I. I trained with him really intensively and I took on sort of teaching, I became a yoga teacher and really sort of went deep into my spiritual practice, really the inner world and started running, helping them run their yoga center. Mm. And, um, and then I got pregnant. Ah, Actually, I got, I went on a permaculture course. <laughs> <laughs> got pregnant on a permaculture got, course. <laughs> well, I met my son's dad on a permaculture course in Findhorn. So it's like, earth center of the universe yeah. well certainly of the of great britain anyway um and uh and then i think that sort of went off and did the yoga training so yeah that had 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 my son around that time as well 
well, nine months later. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. More or less. <laughs> so some quite, yeah, pretty big transformational sort of experiences going on. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've 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 always been, I'd say, like a a seeker in a way. Sort of I've always been intrigued by the unseen. And I just think like we are so capable of perceiving so much more than mm. what we can perceive and and so I've always been interested in expanding my perception really and um in 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 different ways and because f- yeah like Findhorn Findhorn's one of those places that there's, there's several years where I'd get invited to go to Findhorn every year to something they were doing up there and um I've never actually been up there but um <gasps> it's quite a, quite a place isn't it we've got to go yeah <laughs> You've got to go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, I mean, it's not the fact that there's this amazing eco community yeah. there now is, I think, worth a visit in itself. But the landscape there is is really stunning. And there's very, very much something tangible and alive about the landscape there mm. that I still, it's still, I've been there maybe th- four times now. I've spent time there doing different, you know, a permaculture course or cat sitting for someone in a caravan right. <laughs> <laughs> um and yeah it's a, it's a really it's a magical place amazing and so i read that um like you came across chris jordan's work um his albatross stuff um and some of the early films or just the photography mm. i think because that's i came across his photography work i remember yeah and but I've seen you um, uh, comment that that was, you know, that that work, his work, was quite a key moment for you. It was quite a, a moment of something shifted when you. Yeah. Can you t- tell us a bit about yeah, that? Yeah. So I was I was in Bristol by that point. Um, so I moved to Bristol about seven years ago to get into media, um, mm. and I also been writing at that point and so I'd, I was working for the local tv station and I came across the video actually it was on Facebook I think of Chris Jordan's the trailer for the film Albatross which back then was called Midway that's right and like 100% that was a, a massively defining moment in my life like more than all of the environmental things I'd seen in my lifetime for some reason that absolutely it floored me like there was uh, you know something about seeing everyday items of plastic that I was actually using ending up causing like horrible horrible suffering of these incredible creatures Mm. that I was just like okay that's that's the, the strength of my reaction to that was just like so strong that I knew I had to do something about it and that time so that time you were you were working with tv and media and like how, what was so what was going what was the sort of what was your kind of where's the co- co- coyote part yeah what was, was it point? doing there what was it doing how there? did it like, get on the telly <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> exactly <laughs> well i think like after my like guru phase yeah. as my friends called it yeah. <laughs> i um and then become a mum i then you know i was i was a mum and i'd started my writing career and then i actually kind of had this thing at about age 33 i was mm. in australia visiting my my brother who lived there and I just had I went past the fi- school of film and television and I had this like mini meltdown and I was like why am I having a meltdown looking at this school of film and television and I realized it was because I'd always wanted to act or perform in some way I, it's always something I'd been interested in and wanted to do and, and, I, and I hadn't done it and I think I was having a, a kind of heart's kind of realization that I wasn't quite doing the work I was born to do. So I I came back and did a crash course in TV presenting. Brilliant. <laughs> and uh, a week later, I was doing a seven-hour live webcast. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I love that. Quick crash course yeah. in TV presenting. Then. Straight in straight there. In. Yeah. <laughs> so then I started working for like Green TV and Positive TV. God, I remember Green TV. Yeah. Oh. St- still going, still mm. doing stuff. And, um, and I... Yeah, what you know, tried to sort of develop so you were, a TV you were kind of career. Using these things at that point, then these sort of these different strands were sort of starting to come. Kind together a of, bit. not quite. Right. I mean, I, I, I was. This felt like a new thing, um, and so, so then I felt the move to Bristol come on because I that was where I wanted to be. I was mm. living in Glastonbury before that for five years, um, and 
and the move to Bristol was very much about being, you know, getting more work in the media because whilst the green stuff was great, it wasn't paying the bills and it wasn't that regular. So I got a job for an ethical production company and that then led to me doing the local Made in Bristol TV and I did the daily entertainment show. So I was like producing and presenting a a one hour, uh, half an hour show every day. That, w- that web show? Like no, a, no, it was no. on. It was on like Channel Eight. Was it? Yeah. God, you know. So it, I'm it, a bit dumb it, when it comes to TV. Well, and yeah, and I mean, I don't really know if that many people watched it, yeah. but it was an incredible, really good <coughs> experience for me of learning how to create quick content. Like we had to create four pieces a day, and for me, that was when I, you know, now when I look back before when I started up city to see actually learning how to create content learning to be comfortable in front of a camera mm-hmm. um so and meeting loads of people in the community <laughs> and going out that those kind of things sort of yeah really fed into then the next step hmm. I love I love that it's, it's, it is funny isn't it these these uh these things that unfold and whether we sort of these moments these opportunities and whether we kind of grasp them and put ourselves out there and take advantage of these experimental things that are happening and mm. it's funny how it can be quite you know you know the sort of the difference between actually stepping into those opportunities and not it's quite sort of you know what I mean it's quite a fine line between whether mm. you you take these opportunities on and play with them and yeah. and then they sort of evolve yeah it sounds like thing. that's been part of your journey yeah completely <laughs> <laughs> that's just as you were talking about it was just <laughs> making me think about I was a DJ for many years, do you know what I mean? And so the uh, the idea of just experimenting with mixing things together and different tunes and trying stuff out and, you know, nights where you'd be in like a bar with about 10 people and, mm. you know, you'd have to try and sort of figure out how to keep them in the bar <laughs> and how to get more people in. And, do you know what I mean? Yeah. <clears throat> and you go, oh shit, I've just cleared the bar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or or not. But, it's very you know, tangible, isn't it? You yeah. Immediate feedback. Well, exactly. Immediate your... feedback. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to put this on and they're either going to like, the, the energy is going to go up or we're going to just lose everyone. And uh, <laughs> But it's quite, but yeah, and how these things, yeah, just, it's just, it's interesting to hear. And particularly, I guess, you know, the internet evolving and, you know, because, because, you know, you, you remember these, t- you remember sort of pre- when these, you know, it wasn't possible to, you know, we didn't have the net or we didn't have mm. you know, the to put content out or to create things. Um, yeah, to hear a new tune, you'd have to go to a club, you know. Exactly. You you didn't hear it on YouTube or, you know, <coughs> exactly. like, or radio, and you know, you'd listen to it on the radio, but mostly it was when you were out. Exactly. So I was, uh, I was DJing last week, actually. I don't, I don't DJ that often anymore, but I was. And uh, and there's a, uh, a guy who was just uh, shazamming everything that I was playing. And I was <laughs> yeah. like... I was saying, you know, like when I was like, when I was like, you know, really into this stuff, you had to go, you had to go out, you had to listen to DJs playing their tunes, you had to peer over the, peer over the decks and yeah. try and figure out what they were playing. And a lot of them were white labels. So a lot of them were white labels. <laughs> and anyway. you'd ask them, go, I'm not telling you what it is, fuck off. Yeah. Like, you know, it's like, and you know, it was like, you'd have to hunt stuff down. Yeah. Uh, anyway, it's quit rant about, quit rant about being old. <laughs> uh, <laughs> bloody kids these days, have it yeah. easy. With all these little technology apps. <laughs> Um, anyway, how do we get to that? We were <laughs> we were talking about like the decision points and yes. and moments in your lives, <coughs> and you kind of yeah. yeah so you were so this you off in so, so you were presenting basically, and this was all I was to yeah, and uh, I was, and it was full on, and it it wasn't again, it was helpful, but it wasn't my heart work because it was a lot of entertainment and mm. commercial stuff, and I wanted to do more community stuff and more environmental stuff and the you know the 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 um program channel didn't really want that so yeah when i saw the chris jordan albatross stuff that was really the th- moment for me when i was like well i'm going to do something about this like mm. so um so yeah that's i did a a music video was what i started with so that was in my spare time yeah and there's a, you, you've done a few of these right <laughs> so oh. <laughs> which was the one which was the one you started that we started with many what like what mus- musically well well i mean i i just like i dabble with music i yeah. d- i don't really ever kind of f- i i think that's coming i think yeah. the music is coming is it i've been like it? every like 5 years or something i might write a song yeah <laughs> but um cuz i found a, i found cuz i found one song you did was was it burden yeah that's that the, that's the plastic that the one, one. Yeah. yeah so i'd written a song which wasn't about plastic but i thought yeah. the music video could be about plastic and i thought naively 
that all the, you know it would go viral <laughs> 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 and the kids would love it and they'd all stop drinking coca-cola Brilliant. and uh and using cigarette lighters and they you know we'd solve plastic pollution yeah that would be it <laughs> what happened? so it, it flopped <laughs> <laughs> i am not beyonce uh so it didn't have you know it didn't go out to my millions <coughs> of millions of fans um but it was an amazing starting point you know i did a crowdfunding campaign so i got momentum and from there i i went on and and that's how city to sea started really as i went from there i love that though because that's again it's like this this whole idea of like you know just learning through doing experimenting seeing what happens trying to kind of um it's so um you know I, i don't like to use the collective we word much i'm always conscious of that everyone's different but there is certainly you know, a lot. You know, a lot of people. We overthink shit. We don't think we're good enough. We're not. You know what I mean? We hold back and think I can't do this because I haven't got the right equipment, or mm. you know, someone's going to think this is nonsense. But this idea of just putting things out, which has clearly been at the heart of your work, is just and what and then what happens every time you do something. Mm. So the fact that then that was the birth really of City to Sea is is bonkers because what today City to Sea is what. It's a 30 strong organisation, yeah, right? Yeah, I think we're like 33 staff or something yeah. now and running award-winning campaigns and stopping hundreds of tons <laughs> of plastic from getting into the <laughs> sea. It's like, what? Well, because <laughs> you decided to write a song about albatrosses. I know, albatrosses and I know. <laughs> but it was just, it, and that's the thing, it's like following your heart, isn't it? Like yeah. I knew it was it was a real like heart calling to do something and it started as a music video and then I got really cross about cotton buds and thought I could try and do something with cotton buds and that's when the TV stuff helped and that was when the business stuff helped because I was confident of going into a business and asking for money and writing a sales pitch and amazing so so that kind of it all came together at that point really so t- t- tell us just talk, talk us through the, the emergence of City to Sea then because and like just for for listeners to, I mean, I'll link to all of this stuff as well in the show notes, but just to give people a sense of like where, you know, how this kind of crystallized and turned into this yeah, thing. Sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Because, um, well, I think it, it literally, you know, it started, it w- was very, I didn't, I never had a vision for it and I never had a business plan for it. Um, and when it started gathering momentum, like with Switch the Stick, we got all of the supermarkets to stop making cotton buds out of plastic and make them out of paper instead, which was really significant. And at that point I was like, oh my God, we actually, we can change the world. Like, you know, although the music video was great, but it didn't really have, it didn't, I don't know if it had any impact. But you were already making these connections between what we do in our day, because toilets feature quite a lot as well. In, in they do, in our videos. <laughs> anyway. I get my arse out quite a lot <laughs> exactly, in them, don't I? Exactly. <laughs> and it's, uh, so it's, it's, but, so you'd, you'd sort of make, you were making this connection then about how we live, particularly in our sort of, you know, urban environments and our day-to-day sort of slightly, you know, consumerist lifestyles, or whatever. You were, you were making those, because was it, was it kind of really intuitive for you? It's like City to Sea, it's very very clear what you're sort of, well, at least for me, when, you know, yeah, when I yeah. first stumbled across your stuff, it was like, okay, you're making that connection quite quite clear that what we do in yeah. our day-to-day lives and, and making that connection to the ocean. Can you just talk me through a little bit sure. yeah, how that all came I about? I mean, I think that, that was quite intuitive. So, I, you know, I'd done the music video. I started gathering people in pubs and um sort of open spaces in Bristol to hear what were the issues so I could hear from other organizations and I also tried to align myself and maybe work for other organizations so rather than starting something up and duplicating efforts yeah but no one wanted me <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? Well, they didn't well there were no jobs going you know yeah. and and no one else at the time so I thought was working on cotton buds so I just thought right I'm gonna make this make this happen why did that one why did why did the cotton buds come you, i think there was i was finding hun- yeah i was finding yeah. hundreds of them along yeah. the banks of the river avon doing yeah. um beach cleans or river cleans and that to me seemed like such a simple switch so so that was i mobilized that and by going to the water companies because it was them that they're sort of through their sewers that they were leaking out it wasn't their fault that people were flushing them but it was kind of their fault that they were leaking into the ecosystems so I asked them to give me some money 
um, and I asked them for 45 grand sort of split between 11 water companies and I ended up with 15. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> but it was a great start. Yeah, you yeah, know. yeah. And the, 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 the cotton buds are interesting for this because I remember like, um, you know, when I've gone on, when I've done, taken my kids on beach cleans, in fact, we did, we've done a few on the Avon ones as well. Yeah. But it's interesting, isn't it? Because you find those you find those sticks everywhere. And the first thing the kids tend to go is go, go they go, oh, it's, lolly, it's lollipop sticks. Yeah. And then you're like, no, it's actually the, the earbuds, the cotton buds yeah. things. And that's sort of making the direct connection between our toilets and our seas. And people just don't do that. Yeah. Generally, we don't think of, there is a direct connection between our toilet and the oceans. Yeah. Um, so that was really interesting for me. And then one day I was going along the portway in Bristol with the Avon, you know, next to me. And there was one of those massive tides. And there were islands of plastic floating down the Avon. And at that point, this was back in 2015 when Bristol was the European green capital of Europe. Um, and it would be Europe, wouldn't it, if it was the European green yeah. capital? <laughs> <laughs> European, European the capital clue is in the title. <laughs> <laughs> and at that point, uh, that was really for me when I was like, oh my God, this isn't just happening in the Pacific to Albatross. This is happening right here on our doorstep. So it kind of grew from there. I think getting some success, getting a bit of funding. We launched the refill campaign as well. When you're going into the, just on the, just the water campus, it's kind of interesting. Like what was your, um, like, initially how were you what was your story to them like you're knocking on doors and what was yeah I somehow managed to wangle my way in I'm quite good at wangling <laughs> <laughs> and winging it and I got into this meeting where all the <laughs> yeah <coyoting. laughs> all the um water companies were gathered talking about uh sewage network abuse it was snap actually yeah, snap. S- Sewage Network Abuse Protocol. Oh, snap. I think, yeah. yeah. So I went in there and I was like, I was a nobody. I was a TV presenter and I kind of, you know, it was like, look, I want you to all take a punt on me. I'm going to run this campaign and we're going to sort cotton buds. And they were like, what? No, you're not. Like, are you? <laughs> but three of them were like, well, she might. And given that we're spending £100 million a year trying to sort it out, actually giving her five grand is maybe worth it. Mm. So I just see I love that about your your work and what so that idea of again you know speaking to people in that kind of way that they get which is for big companies bottom line right a lot yeah. of the time but then even into like you know that because this all translates out into you know like water bills you know and what we spend our money on and you know the more we like you say the more we're sort of snapping when we're abusing the uh, yeah. <laughs> the, the system the more money it's going to cost and it's just a really interesting way to sort of approach this stuff uh, yeah to get the you know to get to get the funding yeah Yeah. i mean and and i also when i set up city to see i went through that is it going to be a charity is it going to be a a business is it a non-profit um and i settled on a community interest company because that gave me a bit of flexibility to i felt take more risks and have a bit more ownership of it than a charity um and also still be able to receive donations and uh, so that's worked pretty well for us because you so you started off quite as a, a campaigning right and yeah. using kind of <clears throat> quite you know creative provocative in a f- and fun um ways of bringing the issue to life i mean you you sort yeah. of started like sort of crazy films and yeah. music and yeah i think switch the stick sort of started a bit more seriously and then quite quickly we got into playful stuff yeah. i think i'm quite a silly playful person myself so um which helps when facing the ecological emergency yeah, yeah, exactly. and so that definitely has been a theme for us to create content that was you know maybe not like the most beautiful professionally made content you've ever seen but it was um you know done on a shoestring but hopefully it engaged people like our plastic free periods video had like three million views in 2017 and and that really sparked you know it was very much part of the movement in terms of plastic free periods and, and quite pioneering really. So, but we had a, so much fun making it. Yeah. I mean, and I, again, I'll, I'll, I'll put the links to these films in the, in the show notes, but that, I mean, in, it, were you at the four? Cause I remember that, that feels like it's again, that whole area of plastics and periods and sanitary products. And is really like, you know, it's, it feels like we're hearing a lot more about that now. But you were, I guess, at the, the the forefront of that. Yeah, right? I, I, I am very 
proud of the part we've played in that. Obviously, we've you know had companies like Nature Care and Moon Cup been around for decades, like really doing the most amazing work and and creating these products. And then thinks the washable period pants had come out maybe like really a year or two before us doing our plastic free periods campaign. So all the products were there, but no one had really campaigned on it. Um, and although we didn't really have like a clear ask with the campaign because it was really complicated. I never really felt like Tampax or Lilettes would ever give up plastic applicators. So I wanted us to do more of an awareness raising uh, campaign around the options that were available to people with periods. And um, and so, yeah, I think we were like at the beginning of this, mm. the wave. And how has it, how has that, how have the manufacturers responded to this stuff over the last couple of years then? Where are they Where are the, they at? Well, I think what's interesting is there are now 300 menstrual cup companies out are there. They? Yeah, wow. compared to, you know, maybe three years ago, there was Moon Cup and Luna Cup and, you know, a, a few others that um, have been around for, you know, but, but so that whole industry has just completely blown up. Um, all the kinds of washable pads that are available now, washable period pants. So I think it's, it's a, a booming kind of industry, but how the big industries have have um, responded to it has been. Uh, there's been some greenwashing. There's definitely been a fair amount of that. Um, and but Tampax actually brought out a menstrual cup as well. So to me, that's indicative of how individual action really does make a difference because you know, people say, oh, well, it's just, you know, it's just one person switching to a menstrual cup. But then when you tell people about it and more and more people do it, it sends a message to those companies that, oh, my God, actually, our business is under threat because people are switching to reusables mm. and they don't want disposables anymore. Like sales of disposable period products in the UK have dropped um, in their mil like by millions of pounds. So naturally, then that pushed Tampax to bring out a, a menstrual cup yeah although they say on it you need a new one every year which is complete bollocks you don't need a new like every like six years or eight years or something if you look after it but obviously it, it doesn't go along with capitalism and yeah. perpetual growth does it when things <clears throat> are reusable that's the whole tension isn't it because um and i guess because you've like before we get because there's a there's a few threads here which i want to get into but the just on the just on the sort of the campaigning stuff first of all so there was the there was the cot there was the the, the the sticks or the cotton buds or whatever. What, yeah, what switch the switch the stick. Switch we called it. it was the campaign. There's the there was all the kind of um, the plastic period uh, and products and all of that. And then there's um, there was the what was the other one? Don't Re believe the wipe. Yeah, the wet, the, wipes. <laughs> the wet wipes. The wet wipes. Yeah. Be a good asshole. We had yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of our highlights of this year, the Be A Good Arsehole campaign, which just came from a creative agency in London that had yeah. had the idea and they wanted to partner with someone. And we were crazy enough to say what yes. But we ended up <laughs> saying Andy Circus, basically, you know, a.k.a. Gollum and, and other fine roles, um, was the voice of the talking arsehole. Oh. But the headline in The Guardian was like, Andy Circus has new role as a talking anus. <laughs> <laughs> We're like, yep, campaign highlight. <laughs> Brilliant. I love it. Because the, cause the, cause the wet wipes thing, I mean, that's another... I mean, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? It's like we're so brilliant at inventing, like... Shit we don't need yeah, to. Yeah, basically. <laughs> you know, and making vast... And companies making vast amounts of cash out of stuff we don't need. But then it very quickly becoming... Um, really entrenched in you know in our culture as as a sort of useful stuff yeah you know like wet i mean i can remember like i could i can remember well i think it, the wet wipe thing kicks in well at least kicked in for me when you when you become a parent mm. and <laughs> sort Very of baby helpful. wipes yeah you know? and it's like yeah. and then they and then you borrow one when you're on the loo and you're <laughs> like oh actually it's quite nice <laughs> <laughs> Well, is that, see, I'm not sure I've ever. I mean, I, well, there's like festivals. I think I've had a good wipe with, a, yeah. with a, you know, the, they they big sort of gave these sort of you know essential festival items for like when you can't shower for four days. Yeah, you know, but I, I mean, frankly, I'm sort of. I mean, I'm, you know, I was nicknamed Stick of the Dump from quite a long, young age. So I've sort of like <laughs> I've never really. There's never really bothered me like, being, yeah. but I know you know for many people they're essential things. You know, being able to sort of 
wipe yourself with the, these these kind of products. But they but then I remember seeing I can't remember where it was. Maybe it was through your work. But just like the, how these things are just, I think it was in the Thames or something, how they were like. Yeah, making scum- fat bergs. Yeah, and, yeah. Yeah, I think I talk about them and I did a, a TED talk and talk about, you know, the, the, what, what happens in the sewers when people flush wet wipes because mostly they're made of plastic and people don't realise. So, yeah, it wasn't our sexiest campaign stuff, but it's, you know, it's definitely, again, that thing of connecting our actions to our oceans through the toilet is, mm. is a, a big area for people. Um, and there are alternatives, you know, you can you can get like, you know, homemade sort of gels and things that you can put on toilet paper. If you do want a nice sort of moist wipe, <laughs> then, you know, and now there's stuff coming in, you know, that's actually really changing them. So I think we are seeing change in the industry now as well. Yeah. But there's always a thing, again, I mean, I'm, you know, I probably get, I get shut down a bit from this, but I just do think sometimes as well, like, you know, we we we've sort of created these like kind of absurd kind of range of products that are sort of incrementally supposedly making life more comfortable, and um, I guess that's the thing I'm always sort of thinking about with like what's ahead of us and how we evolve and how much do we need to let go of versus you know this sort of will greenify everything or do you know what I mean make make we'll make all these kind of things better for the environment but actually it's half them you think well you know should we just be sort of letting go of some of this stuff as well is it just sort of like mm. this kind of crazy period of human evolution where we just invented all this crap that we didn't need <laughs> yeah it's like i don't know you know it's I funny isn't it it's difficult when we when we get used to it yeah. and then we like it yeah and then you're asking people to kind of to give up something that they like doing or yeah. that they're doing for you know for what they see as health reasons or um, but yeah, I think I think people that are more switched on and more committed actually find that by taking those things out of their life, actually, it, it you know they're not they don't miss them. Yeah. But we get kind of brainwashed into it, don't we? Yeah, yeah. And what's and so out of all these, um, just we'll sort of just like before we move 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 on from all these kind of disposable things, and we'll get onto water in, in a minute as well. But but just on on the the wet wipes and the cotton buds and the um, period plastics and all this kind of stuff. Like what? Like how? I mean, is there is there any that have been? I mean, they're all successful campaigns and they're all really important. But like, what have you learned from all of that? Like, what what are the takeouts from working with all these kind of these issues? Like today, where City to Sea is, are these still? Do you feel like you've cracked? Have we cracked them? Are we are we sorted? Like, or what's, what's yeah, going on? Yeah, it's a, it's a good it's a good question because the well the single use plastics directive is coming in in Europe and and actually twenty twenty a lot of it starts to take effect. So cotton buds are going to be banned, which is amazing because although we did the supermarkets, obviously there's chemists and there's other things, uh, places that are still selling plastic ones. So obviously with us you know, leaving the EU, we're going to have to make sure that that we also Im- implement the single use plastics yeah, directive yeah. as well um it's cotton buds or is it all ears is that what people do with them or do other things with cotton buds um it? it's mostly ears yeah. eye makeup uh-huh. and you know i don't know bits on babies <laughs> 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 but yeah so that's uh, the, the single use plastic directive has got quite a lot coming in it which does tidy up a lot of this it's going to insist that there is clearer labeling on wet wipes it's going inc- to insist that on period products and wet wipes that on the ingredients list it says what it's made of as well as what's in it or on it because you know people have up to now been able to say oh cotton tampons but they don't tell you it's got a plastic weave around the outside and that the you know the applicators plastic so a lot of the work that we were kind of pushing for in the whole kind of unflushables type campaign work is getting um, some really good legislation coming through on it and that's where you see the big changes happen with with legislation mm. so so that's heartening um they've what been what stops it from sorry to interrupt, but that's the right. thing about i remember you know when i first started exploring climate and sustainability issues and all this kind of stuff many years back then there was a conversation around choice editing you know where where actually legislation just edits out you know it gets to the point where you just you just legislate all the toxic shit out of the system and basically say, you know, this is this is now the you know the, as a manufacturer or as a consumer, whatever. We're, we're only going to give you this the, the least harmful. The, what's what's we you know? It was I guess it's I guess it's money. I guess that comes down to, it, but it just feels like we know so much about what's damaging, 
and what is slowing what stops this stuff just becoming like no brain let's just let's just legislate this stuff out you know we can't manufacture anymore using these materials mm. what, what, i it? think there is a lot of lobbying that goes on mm. um so i think government would maybe ha- act faster if they didn't come up against the resistance from the industry so from mm. the plastics industry for example definitely lobbied around the deposit scheme so you know in terms of plastic bottles a deposit scheme is shown to reduce plastic pollution by like you know from plastic bottles by like 95 percent it doesn't you don't really get them on rivers and beaches when there is a deposit scheme so it's like it's a no-brainer we know it works but the government you know went into consultation and it got massively lobbied by the plastics industry which delays it and they try and water it down and so I think that is a big um a big problem and also our our political system is still very much based on people wanting to stay popular and changes generally are not that popular initially when people see the benefits of it four years five years down the line then great but actually by that point that you know they could have been voted out so they're still playing it safe so I think like disrupting changing the political system to be more representative so like having proportional representation I think would would change things significantly as well Mm. it's all the big stuff isn't it really I know it's like you go from sort of like you know what you clean your bum with to um <laughs> to democracy <laughs> and capitalism and the bloody political yeah system. that's why I stick to toilets <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah it's more funny Just keep on focusing on toilets just... no we know where we are with toilets yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. it's um it, it, it and I can't like... get my ass out in parliament so no. well actually you probably can with XR they get <laughs> well, their they, yeah, they, they get their boobs out bottoms but, out well, they did get their bottoms the gallery. out yeah um, exactly. Seem to, seem to remember. There you go. Um, yeah, it's it's interesting. So so let's talk about water and bottled water because, like, the refill project is another sort of big part of what you do and that you've you've birthed and it's been an amazing thing. I remember I've followed it since it started, since it's a tiny little thing. And mm. just tell you know, let's just explain to our to our listeners like what what is refill and how yeah. does it work and where did it come from i mean it's the, it's the biggest sort of almost obvious kind of like <laughs> uh, oh yeah that's a no no brainer isn't it uh, so i mean for me we were looking at the things that were most prevalent along the water the the riverbanks in bristol were cotton buds and bottles plastic bottles and bottle tops and half of the plastic bottles we were finding were bottled water and to me that was just ridiculous given that in a city you are surrounded by thousands of taps, if not water fountains, of which there were few and far between in Bristol in 2015. There were thousands of taps around. So I was sort of thinking, well, why don't we why don't we carry reusable bottles more? Why don't we feel comfortable asking for a refill? And, um, why, you know, why are we paying for bottled water when it's free from, you know, all of these different places? So I had, you know, we were thinking that it would be that sort of... the the sense was that this would be a really good campaign to to run. My mum was living in Bude and an event where we were kind of talking about launching a refill. Um, someone from her town told us about the refill campaign that was happening in Bude. And so I went and found out about that and we looked at, well, how can we do that on a city level? So we worked um, with the refill in Bude and... Um, and then just kind of sh- sh- shifted it slightly so that it worked on a on a city level. And we piloted it in 2015 with a bit of funding from European Green Capital. And the idea really was to just give people permission, like bright, colourful posters and stickers in windows, get people comfortable with going in and not feeling awkward about asking for a free refill of their bottle. And then that... We got some funding uh, through Geovation, which was part of the Ordnance Survey. It was like an innovation program to build an app in 2016. And then like different councils or water companies started saying, oh, that's a really good idea. Why don't, can we do that where we are? And it was hard going, actually, because I was working on Switch the Stick with Michelle, who was working with us, uh, Michelle Kassar. And then Gus Hoyt was kind of building up the refill campaign. And he had a really hard slog of a year of like trying to sort of pitch it into water companies and get funding. And it was quite hard going and trying to work out, well, how do we get paid for this? How do we fund it? Mm. Um, Because there's logistics, you know, you've got to pay for an app and you've got to pay for, you know, help coordinate volunteers and print 
stuff and yeah i mean you're creating a you are creating a new system and yeah a new, and, you, and a new idea and yeah so it was you know it wasn't easy initially and we weren't sure if it was gonna fly and then like at the end of 2017 the water industry said to me well what would it look like if we funded the rollout of um refill across england and i was like yeah it would look really good <laughs> it would look really really good Thank god you've asked yeah, finally i mean it was pretty amazing <laughs> Um, so they did that dream thing of saying, well, blank sheet of paper, you know, what, what, what do you think it's going to, it's going to look like? And at that point, I'm very grateful for having an amazing mentor. I've been very lucky at having like great people around me that can advise me. And they basically looked at my proposal and told me to triple it based on the fact I'd been working on a shoestring for, you know, like yeah. real shoestring stuff for two, you know, a year or two. And so they kind of brought the actual, this is actually what it's going to cost. If you want to do it effectively, this is really what it's going to cost. So, yeah, thanks to them, we ended up getting, you know, tw actually they negotiated me down, but I ended up getting twice as much as I was going to ask for. Um, and that's when it was a game changer. We could then give refill away for free to communities. So we've now got over 300 refill communities across the UK. So powered by volunteers and they run refill in their own communities, which is amazing. And I love them to bits. What motivates that them? As, that's cause interesting because, you know, obviously some of my work in, involves, you know, communities taking ownership of issues and how, how, how you, how has that rolled out for you? What's, what's motivating those folks to, to become refill catalysts where they live? I think they, people really want to do something about plastic pollution and can feel quite powerless and overwhelmed by what's going on in the world. And so to be given a toolkit and a set of stickers and posters and, you know, that's like, oh, great, I can, I can go out and do that and I can make a difference where I live and I can put them on the app and I can tell people about it. So I think there's, there's that element and there's also, there's a lot of groups that have come together, you know, forming plastic-free communities or, you know, wanting to have plastic-free towns. And it's another thing that they can do together. And I, I, I've i loved that part of it, of just seeing, you know, the, the will of people and, and forming that sort of those community connections as well and, and, you know, building resilience, which I think is is a really key part of where we're going. Mm. And the, 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 the plastic bottle... And the water, the whole water thing's nuts. I remember, like, you know, I, I, you know, I grew up my sort of late, you know, late teens, early twenties, you know, a acid house rave scene, and I remember bottled bottled water. Yeah. I remember it a just being a thing that you know you needed to have lots of it. Yeah. And and then and then it became a thing. And I remember like I remember the bottled water brands becoming brand. You know, I remember Evian becoming like you know walking around with a bottle of Evian was cool. <laughs> you know, yeah. It's like. <laughs> You know, you'd have it in your bag, you know, and stuff. Yeah. And, then, and then you I mean, and then you just consciously, I can remember like, when I used to DJ sometimes, you can remember like end of the night and you'd look out and the lights would come on these venues and just be, the whole floor would just be covered in bottles yeah. of water. And you met, I remember, I remember becoming very aware of that relationship with water and it becoming this sort of commodified thing, you know, and and then how how you sort of quite quickly yeah, you could sort of see, almost sense the sort of madness of it. Do you know what I mean? That mm. This the thing that's just, is the essence of life, right? You know, yeah. water. You know, and, yeah. And then suddenly how, how quickly w the destruction and, you know, the mess and the pollution and the energy and the waste and the materials all just to fulfill this sort of basic thing. Yeah. And now seeing this kind of, you know, we're in this kind of transitioning away into this kind of refill culture. Yeah. And it's sort of... It's kind of a bit messy and you know what I mean? And it's sort of like you can, you know, you see, and, and I mean, I, I personally, you know, if I've, I tr you know, I'm mean, sure like many people, you know, you've got several refillable bottles and sometimes, yeah. you, sometimes you forget one or lose it or whatever and slightly feel slightly embarrassed like having to buy a plastic bottle of water or something. Yeah, or there's definitely more plastic shame around that. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> plastic shame. And, uh, and you know, I don't know. It's just yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? When you, when, in, when you're able to kind of see, you've seen something emerge and become part of culture and a, an ingrained habit, and now we're seeing it. You know, hopefully, you know, we're seeing it 
we're, we're shifting away yeah. again and, and that's all happened actually in you know when you think it's about it's relatively short relatively isn't it? short right yeah. a really short period of time yeah because i was at um a gig like oh i don't know i think last year at the o2 in bristol was a xavier xavier rudd xavier rudd right and um at the end, I was the only person in the whole club that had taken a reusable cup with me. Right. <laughs> I, and at the end of the night, it was a sea of plastic cups on the floor. And um, and so that's like, you know, you think that's like a thousand people a night or more going through those. And that's like just one small gig space in Bristol. Yeah. So a, a huge amount of plastic. And that's that we are starting to now see people waking up to that and thinking, right, the transition now to reusables and washable cups. And, and we've just, I'm like super proud of this. Our team have just um, landed a partnership with Wembley and Wembley are transitioning to reusable cups and they're partnering with City to See on it. And this, um, I, I think they're called Stack Cups. Um, I can't remember their name, the company that are doing it. But it's amazing, and it's like, wow, that's that's reaching mainstream, isn't it? If people then are realizing well, you're paying a quid extra for this cup, you know, and um, uh, and then there's a value on it as well. Yeah, and, and it's, they get um, reused. And it's it's um, I've had this I've a sort of riffed on this a bit. It's something that I just find quite well, it's sort of amusing and slightly curious. Is that it, it, we've sort of it feels like we've been in a really kind of like um, slick period of time where everything you know i think where everything got digitized and design got really slick and you know and we've sort of you know user experience and stuff and disposable culture sort of fitted quite well into that kind of thing you know what i mean because you'd mm. you know you can buy you know buy a drink or buy your lunch and buy the stuff and it's all sort of slickly packaged up and off you go and but then you sort of, and then you've got this sort of mad waste, pollution, energy, materials, and mm. everything. It always it's blew my mind sometimes. You just sort of come out of, you'd eat a takeaway, you know, like lunchtime, you might get a sandwich and a, and a drink. And I'm talking like a couple of years ago, probably even for me. Yeah. And then you just, then you put it in a bin, like, yeah. you know, just like you use it and then just put it in this bin. And it's like, there's like kind of 500 years worth of potential <laughs> yeah. life in that thing that yeah. you've just demolished in 60 seconds, yeah. you know? And so now, but it, but the whole process is is quite slick. This sort of packaged, and and now actually, when you when you go when you go into kind of the sort of refill shift, it's quite messy. Like you know, I can remember it's like I, I'm still conscious of the moment. You know, I can be like I'll go to Pret or whatever, and I'll and I'm in a queue, and then they're like, "What do you want?" And I'm like, I have to sort of bend down to get my refill cup out my ass is hanging out <laughs> yeah. and it's like and there's a bit of old old dodgy kind of uh, old chocolate at the bottom <laughs> of it <laughs> a bit of old yeah. there's a sort of like sort of slightly mouldy flat white liquid in the yeah. bottom you know and you're like and you put, and it's, a, it's it's not that slick do you know what I mean and uh, but I quite like it's quite funny it's quite it's amusing and it, but it's still we're moving and it yeah. does, does feel like moving into this kind of next transition <laughs> yeah. away from really highly disposable and, and I think that's where the innovation is coming in like <laughs> yeah. things like cup club where you don't have to use the same cup and you right. don't have to carry no one it no to see my bum and you can <laughs> no, but that's the good thing about it <laughs> Yeah, but you know, I mean, like, where do you put stuff? You know, and you I get know. like spillage you, and you stuff. You end up needing a massive bag, and yeah. you know, it's. I mean, it is. It is like it. it you have to be quite dedicated, and even yeah. like taking your, your, you know, your reusable like washing liquid and refilling your washing liquid. It is quite messy. Yeah. But I think that's where we're at now. It is all a bit messy, and then yeah. we're going to design the shit out of it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, going to yeah. become. It'll be slick again. It'll be slick again. <laughs> it'll be slick, and it'll be cool. Yeah. Um. And it'll be, it, you know, it will be normalised. And I think, especially with home delivery, like sort mm. of online shopping, you, you can that does allow for reuse. Like your hummus could come in a, a reusable pot that you put back out when they you yeah. know, come and deliver the next order. Yeah. So, yeah, I think we will be seeing changes there. And with Refill, we're expanding our Refill campaign to, to do more as well. So the app has been a huge success and we're expanding that now so people can find where they can refill their lunchbox and get a discount and coffee cups, but also find zero waste shops and unpackaged selections at supermarkets and things like that. Yeah, which is brilliant. It's like, I mean, and uh, so about 18 months ago, I went to this hack with my friends at Glimpse and it was a, a day, or we were, it was a, again, it was an ocean plastic related hack and... Uh, and um, and actually, there was a team that that concepted something uh, for like Leon. The idea was again, but it was around um, you know lunch boxes, uh, lunch boxes that you could refill and mm. stuff. And and then I saw your 
I saw your thing press release a couple of weeks ago or something on, yeah. on this thing. And I was thinking, this is brilliant. You know, it's just like how fast things are actually starting to happen. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, no, I think it's great. And it, but it is, it is, it is, it is a big shift, though, isn't it? It is a big shift to shift away from this disposable based culture, which for many, many people have never, they've never known anything else apart from. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and um, it's and it's still kind of that wheel is still turning in terms oh, of the like powerful. hyper sort of packaging everything and now like with the meat that you don't even have to touch because it comes in its own plastic thing and it's got its own plastic glove and it's yeah. like what's the know. maddest packaged thing you've come across can you um most oh god there's been so sort of many um i mean i think like the the classic kind of like cauliflower steak you know that sort of chopped up cauliflower steak in a plastic tray with a plastic wrapper you know that was like the you know, just ridiculous. And then things like single wrapped oranges wrapped in plastic. It's like that kind of stuff drives me a bit batty. Yeah. There's, um, yeah, I mean, I guess it can, because that's the thing with this stuff, isn't it? As you can think sort of like, you know, we're winning and then and then you just see the sort of absurdity. And then you read um, like, you know, um, plastic production facilities that, are, you know, the investment that's going into that still and, and I don't know all the numbers, but you, you, I get, I get a sense that you know plastics are a, a big piece of the fossil fuel, yeah, um, economy these days, right? They're well, becoming more so, yeah, because because we're dropping off on the amount of fossil fu fuel used for energy and used for cars. The the oil industry is like, well, you know, where else can we sell this stuff? Mm. So they're like bolstering the the plastics production industry so yeah you're looking at hundreds of billions in the u.s being in, invested in new fracking infrastructure to to, to supply feedstock to the plastic industry so w you know th they're scared the plastics industry is scared as well uh, you know or threatened um because actually they've been uh, working on the assumptions that millennials and and the who comes after them <laughs> it's Gen X, yeah. uh, you know, want more plastic, but actually they don't. So you know, that's that's the good news. Crazy, and so, um, and then because and also, and you've been doing some interesting things with like um, refillable bottles as well, haven't you? You've got like a is it, who is it? Who are you doing some work? Chilies, with? Yeah, our with partnership chilies, with yeah, Chilies. Yeah. yeah, I mean that's just been an amazing partnership. I mean, it made sense for us to to have a, a bottle for people to buy, but I didn't really want to become a bottle manufacturer when there's some really good ones out there. So we partnered with Chili's. Their, their refill bottle, um, they've got a, a whole range of bottles, but the refill one, we get £10 every time someone buys one of those, which wow. is a significant. And yeah. it's been a really amazing product partnership for us. It's really helped us thrive and fund our campaign. So, yeah, those kind of... That's, for us, is another way we diversify our revenue stream so we're not reliant on the water industry or we're not just reliant on Chili's or, you know a corporate partner or donations we kind of try and mix all those up mm. one of the things i've thought about um in my strange way is um sometimes with seeing these fountains pop up um drinking fountains um which are uh, which are great and really funny. quite often like um at uh like at airports they always have them really near the toilets which i was finding yeah. slightly, <laughs> something slightly odd about that yeah, I, they I mean do. i get that's where the water systems are but just something and then the other thing i was thinking is like could they be a bit more joyful looking? i know do you know what i mean that <laughs> does my head in it's sort of like you know it's kind of like this begrudging all oh, right we'll put in a water fountain and then they're like really shit and boring yeah. instead of these really interesting visually arresting yeah. you know i want to see like the decals on the floor the water drops that lead you to refill yeah. and that point them out to you i mean with that you know I, I love locally bristol water have been great at installing water fountains but they're invisible yeah you just don't know they're there yeah. so I saw, I saw something you i think it was bristol water that you were doing it, where they had the, like the old look like the sort of beer pumps yeah the water pumps they're quite fun yeah they're brilliant but they're the kind of pop-ups pop yeah. used at festivals that's their water bar which has you know stopped yeah yeah, tens of thousands of plastic bottles from being used at festivals. But there's something, isn't there, about we feel it feels like again these kind of shifts, like how to how we might make them more playful, totally. more creative, a little bit, and more give people a better experience. Yeah, right. It's got to be better than what you were doing before. I think for it to really, you know, for it to really shift. And I, I that's one of the things that I I advocate, and we do at City to See, and I talk about in in the book is is sort of 
there's a better way that's way more fun. Yeah. And I think that's how we kind of, in a slightly Pied Piper way, you know, it's like, oh my God, it's really fun to be using a reusable bottle. Or it's like, I'm having a really good time using my menstrual cup. Or yeah. It's kind <laughs> of like, but actually it's really satisfying yeah. having a zero waste period. Yeah. You know, it's satisfying having a less a more zero waste lifestyle when you you only have to put your bin out once a month it's kind of and when we share those things with people we share the joy i think that's when we kind of switch people on isn't it it's sort of so let's let's that sort of takes us let's let's talk about did you like my little lead into my book i was gonna say let's talk about (laughs) i mean it was quite a smooth transition you see uh but (laughs) (laughs) it's it's like oh we gotta wind this up little pathway into the book Uh, (laughs) and uh um yeah, my coyote loves <laughs> writing. Yeah. How to save the world for free. I've got my copy now. Woo-hoo. And um, so it's one thing, so let's just, uh, I mean, we'll, we'll go into it. But one thing I find interesting about what you're doing, um, well, there's many things, but one thing um, I think currently, just also because of, if we look at the sort of context of the climate emergency and, you know, the ecological crisis and all the stuff that's blown up this year, particularly, it's really coming to a, well, it feel, you know, as we, you know, it's, it's what do they say? The, was the, is it the Oxford Dictionary? Was it the word of the year, climate emergency, apparently, in yeah. Britain? Apparently two words. Like, last two, year yes, they did two words too. They did single use last right, year. Single use, that's it. <laughs> but, um, but it's interesting that there's been a lot of noise this, this year, particularly around system change right and um you know that we need and you know all the stuff that you know we many of us who've been immersed in this stuff for many years you know have felt is as is is the only way you're going to really see this kind of radical change is through and where we are now from a science perspective and you know this need for kind of big systemic shifts through legislation and you know rethinking pretty much everything at a systems level and in many ways, it felt a little bit, to me anyway, it felt a little bit this year. And actually, maybe even my own, even maybe I've been pulled into that quite a bit this year, that, you know, what we do on an individual basis, is it as is it as valid? Is it as, you know... And actually, just um, looking at your book, again, it's made me realise again, because a lot of your work very much pulls it back down to mm. what we can do on an individual level... Tell, tell me about that and like how's where did this all come from you know when where did the book come from because it is a real focus on what you can do yeah. as an individual right yeah and I, I I really felt like I wanted to take people who'd got interested in plastic pollution on that journey to look at all the other things going wrong in the world um and and I missed writing as well I sort of you know it's it's my my first love really and so I wrote out a chapter sort of chapter summaries for a book that I felt like I wanted to write about campaigning and individual action and how we can change the world and I got really busy and just you know didn't do anything with it and two weeks later a publisher got in touch and they'd seen my TED talk and they're like hey we'd, we'd like to publish a book we're thinking you know it's sort of about individual action and changing the world you know would you be interested in writing it and I was like yes I would actually <laughs> I've got one just ready one for I, that yeah exactly I kind of so met up with them called Lawrence King and um, the publishers and it was just real flow timing and I do feel like I'm very grateful for the flow in my life and being on that journey because it, it was like yeah we're ready for this I'm ready for this and and I think that I, you know I, I've I've noticed that too and there was almost part of me that was like oh can I write a book about individual action when we know that we have to bring about system change and but I knew that through plastic pollution thousands if not more of people even just here in the UK have woken up to the environmental crisis through plastic yeah, gateway the gateway drug exactly yeah so uh, you know i and i'm you know we've got like i don't know forty thousand people connected to us through city to see and i was like well let's let's start talking about the other issues um so that's that's what i did in how to save the world for free and and also i I'm I'm a massive believer that you know individual action is actually the only thing we've got you know from you know whether we're a politician it's still individual action or if we're voting that's still individual action um if we're standing for election you know all of the switches that we make and the changes we can make in our businesses if we you know we don't all have to give up our day jobs and become environmental campaigners but we can make massive changes on the inside of of big business so 
I wanted to give people a sense that and give tangible examples like we spoke earlier about Tampax bringing out a menstrual cup and Mm. you know people are like and it's quite funny how plastic now is also slightly scorned on by like hardcore environmentalists so like George Monbiot um said that you know cotton buds was like micro consumerist pathetic bollocks (laughs) which I called him on on stage which is particularly fun um you know, but that's 400 tonnes of plastic that's not being made from fossil fuels, mm. that's not being flushed into our ecosystems a year. You know, that's that's big changes. So I'm getting, getting more passionate now. Aren't no, it's I? Good, it's <laughs> so good, it's good. I think, like, I, I think, you know, individual action is, is the best thing that we've got from how we treat ourselves to how we treat each other and how we treat the earth. And um, so start there. And also, I, I think you know it does it does massively add up so i do talk about system change i talk about you know politics and democracy in the book and other forms that seem to work better um i talk about capitalism and growth but i'm not an academic and i'm not an expert but i give people little sort of introductions to those subjects so that you know we can each follow the one that sparks the most joy in us yeah and and i guess it's you know what what strikes me and in, in a lot of the um the journeying I I've been doing over the last years is coming back to re- into relationships it's the relationships we have in the world you know whether it's again you know our, our own stories our own relationships with the things around us the relationships we have with the communities around us whether it's you know the organizations we work in or the places we live and then our relationship to the to the wider you know living world mm. and it actually I guess that's the thing. It, it's it is it is this whole thing, isn't it? It's top down, bottom up. It's only through these relationships, only when we start to become aware of the things that we're in we're in relationship with, whether it's plastics, products, things yeah. we're putting inside us, people around us. It's it's only really through um, those relationships that we're able to either evolve our own behaviour or shift our way of looking at the world, or you know we we can we can sort of demand the system changes yeah but ultimately you know it life is happening right now in front of us isn't it it's yeah sort of, that's what's going and, on and we are the system aren't we right you know it's like <laughs> it's like yeah. we are that person in there you know those people in there are us and if they're being hammered by their someone in their family he's like why are you still using a plastic toothbrush why haven't you switched your energy yeah still that inf- you know infiltrates and influences them doesn't it yeah Totally. I mean, I was, I, was, I um, I got as I said to you, I had um, I I tried, I planned to get hold of the book a lot, away before we had our conversation, but when it actually arrived today, <laughs> yeah. and I opened it up, I opened it up, and the first thing that I opened it on was planet positive porn. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> which I, which you I obviously need to you obviously honest. need to read that bit dad <laughs> I, know, I know which i wasn't expect and planet loving lube oh and, yeah and then I, and i realized there's a whole there's a whole there's a whole i mean because it's in, you've got you've got is it eight sections of the there's book? 12 12, 12 chapters 12, on yeah. like how to save the world while you so while you eat while you drink while you travel and yes there's how to save the world while you have sex yeah and um, I, did, I, I didn't that statistic that's actually struck me which is it says what was it um just under one third of women and three quarters of men watch porn online at least once a week. That's quite it's, mental. It's significant, <laughs> isn't it? It's significant, and, isn't it? And then and people aren't thinking about the data that that uses and what powers the data and what you know the the energy consumed using you know storing all of these internet files. It's it's huge. It's vast amounts of energy being used um, watching watching porn or watching netflix you <laughs> yeah, know. Yeah, exactly. i mean you know or sending emails so we're all ranting at the fossil fuel industry but actually it's porn that's yeah, taking, yeah. <laughs> that's taking us um, into this crisis and i was you know it's, it's a very it's a playful chapter but it's also yeah. the chapter that i talk about population and growing population so talking about contraception and and how we can support um uh, the education of women and, and girls around the world to help with with the population crisis so but yeah, learning to make flaxseed lube was one of my highlights. <laughs> writing the book It's amazing stuff. It's absolutely brilliant. Um, so yeah, I, I think I enjoyed that chapter. Yeah. Um, you know, even the fact that like the sex toy industry is something like a something like sixty million 
dollar industry or something just sex toys and and we don't recycle them and we don't reuse them <laughs> you know there's yeah i've i've found many a sex toy on beach cleans randomly so that's interesting one i mean i we have a a, a, a mutual friend matt golding who's been um who i've been it's on several occasions the last few years have ended up in these uh conversations with him about a vibrator <laughs> made from, yes. uh, from plastic in i'm fact, glad I'm you're having lovely intimate <laughs> conversations <laughs> about you <laughs> exactly um that um but yeah and how actually how and in fact because there was something recently one, one was it um in fact this was my son showed me this he's 14 so but he showed me this thing about Pornhub was um they did a done, thing on did, plastic yeah ocean plastic yeah. yeah they did they they shot a whole scene on one of the most plastic polluted beaches on on the planet yeah I mean um, I think I like that got slammed in the press but I was I think it's great because it's still reaching into audiences. Yeah. That, that maybe weren't switched onto it. And again, like you say, the gateway drug, if plastic's yeah. the gateway into environmentalism, then, you yeah. know, bring it on. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting, you know, um, again, with, you know, this whole idea of, like, individual action. And as I said, you know, I think people have got, yeah, at least the more activists uh, in our society maybe have been quite burned out by, you know, the lack of change from action. But what I, what I, what I love about what you're exploring here is also like, um, I guess the connection we can make to life through these kind of things. So even like the, like the idea of, uh, you did a whole section on, on, um, on water and our, obviously our relationships to water, but even things like, um, finding a bath buddy, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know, but I mean, in our household, that is, I mean, that's solid behavior. You know, yeah. I'm usually the last one that gets yeah. the bath water, but yeah, it's cause you, it's but, cause you're the, the dirtiest. <laughs> yeah, that's but, why. Quite possibly. It's cause you're the I'm always down in, down in the shed talking, <laughs> talk, talking nonsense to people. Yeah. But, um, uh, <laughs> but, 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 but again, these kind of like, I, lo I love these kind of these ideas because they are actually about connection as well. Right. And, you know, you read, you know, s from what I understand in the UK, you know, we seem to be in a crisis of loneliness yeah. and depression and more and more people have less and less connection, you know, uh, you know and, and actually, again, what's interesting about, um, you know, p the potential maybe that's right in front of us right now is that this isn't just about like, you know, this whole thing of like, let's, let's, let's try and, you know, stop our destructive behaviors but let's also like let's like reimagine how we actually live and like let's start bringing more fun connection and possibility and yeah participation back into life right yeah and that's really clear in in the book yeah I mean. absolutely because you know it ultimately it's we're all gonna have to buy less stuff we're gonna have to share more we're gonna have to grow more food and that all involves other human beings. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and and it's joyful and it makes us feel better. And then when we feel better, we buy less shit that we don't need because we're not trying to fill this empty hole. We've, you know, we're feeling nurtured and we're feeling loved and connected. So, I, you're, you're, I think you're, you know, it's completely right there. It's, it's such a key part. And um, and like you know, even going on a beach clean, like it ticks all five boxes of the the sort of scientifically proven ways to feel happy. A, a beach clean as long as there are other people on it ticks all five boxes you know so you end up feeling really well and happy at the end of it it's quite it is like um <coughs> it's such it's such bonkers times isn't it because what like you know when you when you look at as i say ultimately this idea of sharing more buying less um you know being in community more being in relationship more with each other with the natural world all this all this great stuff but it basically does mean buying buying less, you know, like consuming less. Yeah. Um, and this whole idea of a different type. This, I mean, again, because it's it's just interesting to me, right? You know, right now, where are we? We're about to have, you know, we're weeks away from a general election in this country, and you're starting to see, you know, obviously all this kind of, you know, all the kind of craziness that's going on, different political parties. Um, and even uh, one thing that's caught my attention recently, because I'm actually working on a project around sort of well-being at the moment, and, and this idea of the four-day week, which has been you know knocking around for years in <coughs> in academic circles as a, as a kind of maybe part of a solution to you know our sort of, you know what could be a post-growth idea that we could work less and we'd enable more money to flow around, more people to work. But you know, we 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 will have more time for other things. But you that I that four day week thing. I think Labour put it in their manifesto or something. 
And you've had like the right wing media just pull it apart as this kind of like nonsense kind of idea that mm. you know no one will have enough money to live and you know they, they they they've totally taken the concept and put a different narrative on it you know and i, I so it's just this weird thing isn't it that we have that for many still this idea that actually you know we could there could be another way of living yeah you know, that we, we could have a world where we don't have to work all the time yeah. that we could make you know the systems, the things we need, energy, transportation, food, housing, we could make that much more affordable, much less um, expensive, mm. you know, and free up more time. And But but it, there's still, it feels like, the, the you know, back to the system, it does feel like there's still a, there's a hell of a lot that doesn't want that, doesn't want that story to, you know yeah. what I mean, to travel and, still. And, and, th- and then I think it's sort of, again, like going back to that individual action thing of like, if there are then pioneering companies that do it anyway. Right. And then they're the ones that can tell the story of saying, well, actually, it does work. And look how productive our staff are and look how happy they are. Right, exactly. And actually, people are growing more veg because they've got more time and they're actually cooking their own food and bringing it in in reusable containers because they've got more time. Yeah. You know, <coughs> their kids well, are happier. The, they're, yeah. <laughs> you know. Exactly. And, yeah, and that's the thing. Exactly right. Because you're seeing these. I mean, I think it was at the same time this thing was being taken apart by the times or someone it was and i and i saw at the same time like microsoft in japan had just done this four day week experiment and like you know it's like off the scale in terms of productivity off the scale in terms of how good people felt mm. off the, you know so that th- again like th- we know that these stories are out there but it's just yeah ha- how how will they become you know how might these things accelerate i guess in yeah. amongst you know, I don't know. I don't know. I'm rambling a bit, but yeah. <laughs> well, I think, and that's, I think, it's that thing of following your joy and your bliss, isn't it? And doing what you do, doing it for the earth, and and kind of not being that attached to the outcomes. I think is the my my ethos. So if you're really into like business and 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 staff satisfaction and like i think that's such a great area then to explore those other models right. of 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 working um and yeah be the person that's piloting those and encouraging those um whereas if you know writing silly songs and writing books or whatever your thing is yeah I think I think we just have to do that because we don't know, do we? We don't know if it's going to work. We no. don't know if we're going to. We've got no idea. You know, we we might all just burn ourselves out in some crazy digital fossil fuel frenzy. Yeah, um, and we're doing quite a good job. At it, yes, <laughs> we are. <laughs> but so this is in the so, meantime, yeah, you know. so interesting what you're saying though, because that's the thing, like the not the not knowing thing. Again, I'm going to get political because it's, it's so there. But I was watching something last night on iPlayer, and it was I can't remember what her name is. Don't watch much TV. Was it Victoria Derbyshire? Have I got that right? But she was basically, it was like, it was it was guy from the, Jonathan Bartley from the Green Party was, was talking about, you know, their manifesto. And um, and I don't know where they were, but it was, a, it, cars came up, car ownership came up. Yeah. And she started like saying, putting him on the spot going, because someone in the audience was going, well, you know, there's a car factory down the road, blah, blah, blah. And she was going, can you guarantee that with your policies that that, that person will still have a job making cars in 10 years time? And I was thinking to myself, what an insane question yeah, absolutely. to ask. Absolutely. Do, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And this whole idea of certainty. Yeah. And so for me, again, what's exciting at the moment, but, but what is still challenging for me is the fact that wouldn't it be great if we just said, look, you know, we've got no idea if we can do any of this stuff, but we've got to give it a go, right? We've just got to, yeah. we've just got to try things. We've got, to, we've got to believe that. Do you want your children to live or do you want a job? <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> exactly. But I want a job making cars in 10 years' time. <laughs> and I want to know that if I vote for this guy, that I'm going to have that job 10 years' time. I just think... Wow, we've constructed this bizarre way of thinking what is important and yeah. what is security and you know what I mean and how yeah. we feel safe about stuff and and so the, you know this whole idea of yeah it, you know we've you know how do we step into this this space now that we're in and and find our own flavor in it and our own way of you know finding the thing that excites us whether it's in our, the work we do or the energies that we have but but being able like you say not to we've got to stop being so hung up on outcome yeah and certainty yeah you know because we we don't know do we you know no idea but <laughs> <laughs> i'm certain this podcast will get out oh i'm delighted <laughs> to hear that <laughs> um 
you just on this though, because you do a lot of speaking as well, right? And you're yeah. sp- you're going into talking with you know d- doing talks with corporates and stuff. Yes. H- how's this stuff landing? Like in those um, kind of do you know? I context. mean, I I get invited back, which is a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Doing something right. Um, it's it's hard to tell in those in- environments because you know generally then people move on to the next talk or you know. So I I've had some great feedback. It's difficult to measure impact in those kind of situations, but I'm I'm heartened by the fact that businesses are at least inviting people like you and me in mm. <laughs> to talk to them. Um, that that is a sign that you know people are interested um but yeah in terms of like making those how much change is it is it making happen I, you know again I don't know but I show up I share with love and humor and urgency I love being able to stand on a stage and get emotional about the fact that we've lost half the world's wildlife in my lifetime mm. a lot of the people in the room have no idea mm. And and to have someone stand in front of them clearly kind of upset about it, yet not, you know, I'm not kind of, <laughs> I was about to say, I'm not doing a Greta on her. <laughs> I love her. But, you know, I'm not kind of saying like, how dare you? How dare you? <laughs> love Greta, by the way. Yeah. Just, just brilliant. Um, but, yeah, because, you know, obviously that amount of shame switches people off, mm. you know, it, people can feel very told off and so I think by saying this is how it's affecting me and this is how I feel about it and and I'm trying to do something about it and this is what I'm doing I think that does inspire other people so Mm. I try to do that do that thing I think that's so interesting and I think but I think you're it is it is true as well like bringing these issues into particularly into businesses or organizations and bringing them in in a way that again it's not a a, sh- a, a sort of blaming or shaming thing but you're bringing a pretty you know troubling reality into these spaces again for me that's what i i mean i can remember it was going back to the chris jordan thing when i first came across his work and i was having my about a decade ago i was having his f- photographic work and i was having my own kind of unraveling breakdown of all this stuff <clears throat> but still working in in and around the kind of creative advertising communications world and i remember starting to do talks on this stuff and bringing some of that work in i remember showing his work in a in a, in a talk actually at a big agency and it freaked a lot of people out and mm. and, I, and i remember over the years i'd sort of ran away from a lot of that but in the last particularly in the last year you know being asked to come in and talk about this stuff again but actually now seeing how you know people are really wanting to know even if it's really uncomfortable and actually that it's that we've got to break these back you know we've got to sort of break these bounds you know because there were things that you know this is work we can't talk about you know or this is life but actually now it's feeling like these things need to be coming in Mm. we need to be creating these kind of spaces where this stuff can be you know landed and explored yeah um because you know you you know we have to yeah it's interesting i was listening to um something robert mcfarlane's said recently on his podcast but he was talking about what a time to be alive because actually like the awareness now of our um the responsibility of our legacy has never been so like profound really yeah you know, that what we're now going to be leaving behind yeah who was that person that said it was something like we're the we're the first generation to realise the consequences of our actions and the last generation to be able to do something right, about it. Right. It's, uh, yeah. you know, which is pretty terrifying as yeah. well. And it's, you know, it is, it is a lot to carry. I think especially as, you know, parents and people thinking of bringing children into the world, it's like, you know, what, what kind of world are we bringing them into? And, and they don't have the same kind of what we thought was like a guaranteed future. It's right. not, it's not kind of there anymore. Yeah. I mean, my, my son's, friends are saying that they're not going to have kids yeah. which is you know for 16 year olds to be thinking like yeah, that right. is it's kind of heartbreaking it is and yet what a time to be alive yeah. like you know we, this is it this is the moment yeah yeah exactly and that, that's and i said that's that's the thing i think when um you know li- listening now listening to where where you've got to and what the book is bringing up and as i say i can get quite 
quite burnt out at times and it's like oh, what's the point but but actually the other this bit of this moment is the fact that we are in this moment in time where it does feel like if we can lean into this step into this stuff that you know the, the possibilities are like could be extraordinarily beautiful as well <laughs> so you know in amongst yeah, the darkness yeah. yeah there's sort of possibilities of something very different yeah. Um, that can come through this and this kind of awakening in, that people could have. And if we can find ways for those particularly who have had a real fucking shit time of it, mm. um, you know, how, how, how do we, how do we build this stuff up from the most vulnerable, you know, in the bottom up, um, you know, the possibilities could be, could be quite extraordinary. Yeah. Um, so you know yeah maybe this is the uh, the dark before the dawn that's right the descent <laughs> the necessary d- darkness um in order for sort of you know visioning to happen doesn't it, it sort of does feel like we're sort of yeah you know we're, we're, <laughs> we're down there somewhere yeah well it's good to be down there with you <laughs> exactly in the old <laughs> Here and the, you all listeners that have stayed it, with us it, for exactly, this whole exactly. time. So just um, just on that, wh- what's coming up? Like, what? How can people engage with what you're doing? And like, is there anything? Like, is this? Is what's? Yeah, what's coming up for you in the next few months? And well, I um, I'm definitely feeling like I want to. So refill has got, you know, 300 community initiatives around the UK and my book obviously just came out and I'm feeling like my I did I did a book launch in Bristol and for the first time I brought all bits of my creativity to that book launch I didn't do any readings from the book I did a bit of talking a bit of some silly poems that I write some silly songs that I write my partner sings silly songs as well on his banjo lele and it's a yuki banjo or <laughs> <laughs> so a ukulele banjo basically uh. and i played the ukulele a little bit and i had the best time and people had the best time it was playful and silly and funny yet meaningful and i am feeling like taking that out more next year nice. so i think kind of hopefully coming to a community near you singing maybe not dancing but you know certainly time for us to be together and and have a laugh you know because it, it is yeah talk about change and what we can do share ideas um switch people on to their local food growers and introduce yeah. people to that but doing it through through play is yeah. um i think what i'll be doing a bit more of next year Love that. as well as you know city to seas campaigns are going from strength to strength but i've got a great team there so yeah for me it'll be getting the book out there um if people want to connect i've got a website yeah I'll stick that. I've got st- one of them, I'll and st- City st- to Sea's got two websites: one for Reef and one for City to Sea. Um, and generally, Instagram and Twitter, I'm sort of most active on. Um, if people want to be in touch, and yeah. you know, I'll stick all of that in the uh, in the show notes. Amazing, and various links, yeah. and all that. Well, thank marvelous. You. Well, thank you for uh, taking the time out. We've been trying to do this for a while. We have. We? Thanks for having me in no, your in your shed. Shed, shed ship spaceship <laughs> space, spaceship shed space, space shed earth yeah um, <laughs> no really great to and talk to uh, you and I, I really appreciate your people listening for uh, for hanging out with us and there's this phrase there are no passengers on spaceship earth we're all we're all crew and i just like to sort of like what does that what does that speak to you at this moment in time does that anything that brings I up i think that the um yeah just the the let's all do something I don't think it really matters what really do what you love and then tell people about it. I love that. Do it and tell people about it. Yeah. Thank you, Nat. My pleasure. Yeah, Thanks, we'll, Dan. We'll be in touch. Maybe we'll do another one down the yeah. line somewhere. When you, maybe after the nonsense tour. <laughs> the nonsense tour. <laughs> Can I call it that? <laughs> oh, no, Marvelous. thanks for having me Marvelous and thanks pleasure. for listening, uh, whoever's listening. Yeah. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> So I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Nat Fee. Isn't Nat an interesting human? We could have actually chatted on and on and on and drank more tea. Uh, But I think we'll have another conversation down the line somewhere. Do check out Nat's work. Check out the work of City for Sea. Check out the work of Refill. I'll put all the links in the show notes. And and, uh, get her book. It's a it's a great read and uh, a perfect uh, festive gift, if I get this out on time. Uh, which I will, Um, how to save the world for free. 
Uh, yeah. So anyway, um, that was episode twenty six, and yeah, if you like what you're hearing on this podcast, please give us a like, give us a rating. Give us a review on Apple Podcasts, anything. Just give us something, some kind of signal from out there on the interwebs. It's always lovely. It's lovely to get a little bit of feedback. And it also helps other people find the podcast. If you rate it or like it or share it or do something with it, then uh, others will find it. If you've got any questions or you want to get in touch, um, you can do so. You drop us a line, dan at thespaceship.earth on email. Or uh, currently you can hit me up on uh, Twitter at Dan Solo. I've just set up a little Instagram thingy for for uh, for the podcast, and that's at thespaceship.earth. Although I haven't put anything up yet, but by the time I've done this, maybe I would have done. Uh, anyway, that might build... It's a bit of a commitment starting its own Instagram, but, you know, I'm sort of getting a bit confused on my own personal Instagram. I feel like I might, I might need some boundaries coming. So anyway, follow that one. Like I said, I'm looking for some help, um, someone that can help edit this thing. There's absolutely zero cash in it right now, but just think of all the love, planetary uh, vibes you'll get for helping birth this out every month or every couple of weeks. Um, and you know, there will be uh, major sponsorship deals coming uh, uh, in 2020. I'm absolutely sure of it. Um, I'm kind of curious, I'm actually exploring many of this Patreon tang. I uh, I, f- I fund a couple of folks on Patreon, and I'm kind of wondering maybe I should do it for this. Um, but I don't really know, I'm not very good at uh you know, the whole funding of content stuff, but um, yeah, let me know maybe if you think that's a good idea. Um, but anyway, thanks for listening. Um, it's been a, a full on year. We're reaching uh, the sort of final, uh, final sort of chapters of 2019 in the UK. It's extremely balmy at the moment and um, who knows what's going to happen in the next couple of weeks. But anyway, um, thanks for listening. It means a lot. There's a lot of podcasts out there. So it's great to have listeners. I really appreciate it. Tons of gratitude for the folks that listen and reach out and uh, uh, give me a bit of feedback. It's it's super awesome. So um, look after yourselves out there. Be kind. Um, look after yourself. Look after others. Look after the beautiful Spaceship Earth that supports all of us. Uh, and remember, folks, there are no passengers on Spaceship Earth. We're all crew. Until next time, peace and out. Mm-hmm.